to welcome all of you to this year's uh, North Korean Human Rights Conference organized by the Hanguk University of Foreign Studies, the International Summer Session. I'm uh, Greg Scarlatti, Executive Director of the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea in Washington, D.C. Every summer, I spend a month here with uh, our wonderful students teaching two classes, one on uh, human rights in North Korea and uh, the other one on development and security in North Korea. I'm delighted to see that it is uh, a well-attended event. I hope others will join us. Uh, if you're sitting high up there, I would like to invite you to come down a little bit, uh, if you don't mind terribly. I want to have a whole house in front. This is a very big room. I think it's uh, 480 seats. One day, one of these days, we're going to fill it up. Uh, I would like to welcome um, the students, the fellows in our program, our distinguished guests, <laughs> Minister uh, Aisuke Mibai, representing the Embassy of Japan, uh, Brian, representing the Embassy of the United States, the Embassy of Qatar. He's also represented uh, many NGO friends, Theodora and the others. Thank you for joining us today. Steve, you've been a great friend with HRNK. Thank you for everything you do. He won, terrific member of the team at HRNK, and of course, the team here at Huffs. They've put together yet another great event. It is uh, my privilege to introduce, not myself, but uh, the keynote speaker today, uh, who is none other than His uh, Excellency Yi jong -hun. Um, His Excellency Yi Jong-un was uh, Republic of Korea Ambassador for North Korean Human Rights. He is a um, tenured professor at Yonsei University. He is also the director of the Human Liberty Center at Yonsei University. You have his biography in uh, the conference flyer. All I would like to say about him is that he's a, uh, a true hero to all of us in this field of North Korean human rights a scholar, a freedom fighter, a gentleman, a friend, he's my this on there, my senior from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Uh, he has his uh, BA from Tufts University, his Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy from uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, his Master in Philosophy at uh, his PhD uh, from uh, Oxford University. Uh, he is a uh, widely published author, um, appears very frequently uh, on TV, radio, does, has a lot of media appearances, has continued to be a uh, thought leader for many, many years. It is uh, an extraordinary honor and a privilege to, uh, to have the opportunity to host Ambassador Yi Jong-un here as a keynote speaker. The plan today is going to be for Ambassador Yi Jong-un to give the keynote address after this we will continue with a moderated panel discussion and a Q&A. I think we're running a little bit late. I will still try to conclude on time. Okay, I shouldn't be doing this, but if we need a little bit of added time, maybe we'll do that. I'll try to avoid doing that, but uh, without further ado, Ambassador Yi jong -un, please join me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Greg, for that undeserving uh, introduction. Um, I actually look forward every year to this event. Um, he, Greg Scalatio, who, is, uh, who does a fantastic job, not only in putting this conference together every summer at the Hofs, it's not an easy chore to bring more than 10 people for an event, but he does that year in and year out. Uh, for this very important um, topic. But it's not just the summer event um, that, that, that I, I commend. It is just his overall championship of this North Korean human rights issue, which he does so diligently uh, with the organization called the HRNK, which of course is the co-organizer uh, with the Hofs. Um, I think it's hands down um, one of the, if not the most active and influential 
organization uh, working on North Korean human rights. So um, if, you, if anyone has intent of uh, maybe interning uh, or continuing to work on this issue, you're inspired by one of the speakers today, um, then I think HRNK will be a, you know, one of the best destinations. Um, and there are many uh, former interns who are uh, in this field working on human rights of North Korea. So I know we're um, short on time. So usually keynote speeches are, you know, you read off a text, but um, I know that most of you are students. Um, so I think it will probably be better off in, in getting my message to you. Um, I felt that a PPT uh, would be a, a better delivery vehicle uh, to do so. So if you will bear with me, um, I will go through some background in terms of how human rights, um, the idea of human rights and how the international organization, particularly the United Nations, deals with this human rights component, uh, what are some of the means to deal with the human rights violations, and how can we put the North Korean situation within the larger context of this international communities and the United Nations effort and campaign to deal with North Korea. When World War II came to an end in 1945, um, we knew that you know, lots of things were going on uh, during the war, but when the war came to an end, people were aghast. Uh, people were abhorred by understanding and beginning to find out more and more about what really happened during the war. Some of the atrocities, some of the human rights violations that were blatant and unspeakable particularly with regards to the genocide attempt. Um, places like Auschwitz, Treblinka, and at the end of the day, six million Jewish people killed. I mean, you think about that number, six million. You, you, know, you go to a baseball game, um, and a, in a stadium full of people will be, what, about 25,000, 30,000? How many of those stadiums filled stadiums will make up six million people. Think of it in that sense, and it's just mind-boggling, you know, what, what, what kind of atrocity uh, that went on. The systematic crimes against humanity, the torture, gas chambers, human experimentations, rape, etc. This pictures of Auschwitz. Even before the World War II came to an end, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, American president, in his 1941 State of the Union speech, the four freedoms, which of course becomes some of the founding principles of human rights idea uh, in the post-war period. Freedom of speech, freedom from fear, freedom of religion, and freedom from want. And this emergence of the awareness, growing awareness in the international community of what it means to, you know, what, what is crimes against humanity? What is genocide? What is war crimes? I mean, these are things that happen and we understand, but you know, it becomes more and more thorough um, in a practical term. Um, there's a growing awareness of what, what it actually entails and this international community's version leads to two measures. One is accountability. How do you punish criminals? And two, how do you go about preventing more atrocities? Well, one aspect, uh, manifest aspect of accountability is the tribunals of war crimes. Okay? We're probably, you're probably more familiar with the Nuremberg Tribunal, where many were tried and many were executed. But there was, of course, you know that the Axis power included Germany, Italy, and Japan. So in the Asia Pacific War, um, many Japanese leaders were also tried and prosecuted. So this was one way of dealing with war crimes and human rights violations. 
accountability in action. How do you go about preventing it? How do you prevent, how do you maintain peace? How do you prevent another war? How do you prevent human rights violations? United Nations is created in October 1945. I mean, that's primarily maintaining peace. Preventing another war is the primary. Of course, there are other functions, but this has to be the primary function of the United Nations. And with a particular focus on human rights, in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is adopted. This is not a law, but the principles, some of the most important principles of human rights are embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in its Article 1, says that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Easier said than done. And that human rights should be protected by rule of law, but this is not a law. And therefore, the United Nations goes on to actually adopt laws, making laws. And that's what the international covenants, particularly if you look at the bottom, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, ICESTR. So combining those two covenants pretty much covers all aspects of human rights. The first part, um, the first part, I would say, you know, deals with like political issues, accountability. The second part is where the humanitarian dimension kicks in. These two covenants plus the Universal Declaration of Human Rights combined is what we generally refer to as the International Bill of Human Rights. So these are just you know, some of the details of the um, international covenants, economic, social, and cultural rights, so labor rights, health rights, education, adequate standard of living, as I said, uh, sort of like humanitarian dimension. And then there is the covenant on civil and political rights. These are the, this will be where the prosecutory dimension would kick in. So now we equipped with international law and the foundations of international human rights idea um, the UN and the international community actually takes, starts taking action and trying to roll back human rights atrocities, some of the most heinous human rights atrocities. International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is one of them. International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, you guys are probably all familiar with the uh, Rwandan situation. And then of course the extra, extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge. Pol Pot, the killing fields. So that's great. Okay, so the UN and international community is now much more aware, it's equipped with international law, and it's actually taking action. But well, where's North Korea? Where's international law in, in, in North Korea? That black part in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. Quite frankly, North Korea has been very successful in hiding under the radar of the international attention for decades. It's only in the last 20 years or so that the UN and the international community really start zooming in on North Korean human rights issues. Is it because there are no human rights violations in North Korea? Is that why there's no attention? No. North Korea is a country that violates every single one of the 30 articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These are pictures of public execution. You know, a, a starving child is always, you know, an issue there. And this past, sort of like passport, you don't even have a freedom of, you cannot live, you cannot decide to, I want to live in Pyongyang, and you live in Pyongyang. No, these are all decided by the state. You have no freedom of movement or any, any other freedom in this country. What do the outside world now begin to see? Well, um, John Kerry, um, some of you are probably from the United States, his former US Secretary of State, he refers to North Korea as an evil, evil place. Okay? It's 
cruel things are happening. There are evil that is taking place. Former COI, COI is the Commission of Inquiry. UN Commission of Inquiry Chairperson, Michael Kirby. Anyone from Australia here? No? Uh, he's not only a good friend, but a, a hero to many. He was, the, he was chair of the Commission of Inquiry, and he said that North Korea has committed horrors on level with the Holocaust. I and mean, this is a very powerful, very, very powerful statement to make. So if there are such atrocities and human rights violations taking place in North Korea, why isn't the world paying more attention? Why is there no YouTube uh, concert? Why is Angelina Jolie not going, you know, not addressing this issue? It's probably because in North Korea, we have, I think, hands down, the most closed societies in the world. You have absolutely no access to that society. There are no images, iconic images, with the refugees, you have pictures, you have documentaries from Syria. In Africa, you have uh, pictures and documentaries of little babies, you know, starving, of flies flying around with skeletons showing, okay? You have visual picture. With North Korea, it's very, very limited. So what we have is the testimonies, I mean, some of which we'll be hearing from Mr. Tong Gang Il and uh, Chi Sung Ho and, and Kim Gang Jin. Uh, so, this is the best that we can do so far, but I think it's very, very important. So, I hope that you know, soon we'll have um, you know, very techni technologically advanced drones so that we can have much, viv much more vivid um, images of the political prison camps so that we get to see finally. Okay, what, what they're like. And of course, North Korea is relentless with, with its propaganda. They keep talking about paradise. There's no human rights violations. I hear this directly from the North Korean ambassadors to Geneva. Huh? They, they tell the UN, uh, why are you bothering us? We have no human rights violations. Okay, we are paradise, everyone's happy. And then of course, there are false hope for peace. Peace is a great thing. But let this not in any way supplant uh, efforts and campaigns towards human rights uh, improvement. Make no mistake, North Korea is a, one of the worst totalitarian dicta dictatorial rule. Okay? This is Chang Song Tech, Kim, Kim Jong Un's uncle. He's the number two guy just snuffed out but one of the most powerful people in North Korea, and then next day he's dead, executed uh, violently. I show this picture because this is after immediate, almost immediately after Chang Song Tech was executed. He's the person responsible for the execution you know, at the North Korean ski resort, laughing away. There's no ethics. There's no morality in the society, or at least in the leadership of North Korea. Another family member killed. This is his older half-brother, Kim Jong-nam. You know that he was killed in broad daylight in the Malaysian uh, International Airport by a VX nerve agent. Now, why, are, why am I mentioning Chang Song Tech and Kim Jong Nam? Not necessarily because of their human rights violation, which of course was violated, but I'm just saying that you know, these are some of the, this is a royal family, and their life's taken away just like that. So can you imagine if you're just an ordinary person, what life means in North Korea, okay? Uh, it can very easily be taken, taken away. What comes to your mind when, when we're dealing with North Korean human, human rights? And this is another issue that, uh, you know, there are no iconic images of North Korean human rights violations that just immediately pops up. It's just an amalgamation of so many different things. Um, so this is something that we have to work on, you know, to when we talk about North Korean human rights, that this image 
pops up. Okay? I don't think we have that as yet. But I'm going to talk about a couple of things. One, of course, is the political prison camp. I'm sure that this is something that uh, the, the, um, the, one of the speakers, uh, Mr. Zhang Wang here, will, will talk about, who's a victim. Political prison camps. Political prison camps or gulags, you know, this is, these are not just camps where there are like 300, 500 people living. This, these are towns. As many as 50,000 people actually get born and die in these places. North Korea, of course, claimed that there are no such camps. But HRNK, um, was their great work with the satellite imagery, has very recently published, and this is the publication, I think, which is on, uh, you, has, you can have access online, uh, that there are these camps still operating uh, vividly. This happens to be limestone. Uh, uh, camp. Another major issue, of course, is the North Korean, what we call defectors, but slash refugees. They basically cross over the border uh, from North Korea to China, and many are, you know, tens of thousands in China, and, and few lucky ones are able to find their way uh, via uh, Southeast Asia or other routes to South Korea. This is uh, another, this, this uh, one of the defectors uh, who was in this press conference uh, hosted by HRNK uh, quite some time ago in 2009, but if you can see her thighs and the scars on her thighs, so she's talking about the atrocities, human rights violations in North Korea, and then, you know, people, you know, you, you get the sense that, you know, we can talk so much, and then, oh, is that really happening? Is that real? And, you know, she just stood up at the press conference to show, okay, let me show you, right? And then people's jaws dropped um, to, to see this. Defectors are, you know, that mostly women, um, over 80% now. I mean, these are some of the figures. I will have this uh, material um, circulate so that you, can, you have access to this. Um, but since, like, 19, uh, 2014, it's been about 80% or more. Okay? And defector numbers, unfortunately, have been uh, dwindling because of the uh, increase in the security on both North Korean and Chinese uh, borders. Why it's a problem? Because through the testimonials, they say that as many as 80 to 90% of the women are subjected to some form of sexual assault in the process of defection, including rape. Another of course, uh, problem emanates from China because China does not recognize them as refugees. They consider them as illegal aliens and then rounds them up and sends them back despite the UN's non refoulement uh, principles. And when they're sent back, uh, they're put into camps, and when so, even some of, the, uh, some of the women who are pregnant, um, they're forced to have labor, uh, there are infanticides going on. Um, another problem within this problem is the, uh, through the tens of thousands of North Korean defector women who've ended up living in China for an extended period of time, there are many offsprings. And um, I don't know if Tim Peters is here today, but uh, he does great work on this issue. But he was saying that the orphans from these um, 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 defector women uh, could be, the number can be as high as 50,000. It's a staggering number when you think about it. Then there are, you know, it's not just the political prison camp, the defectors, the family reunion thing. It's only taken place, what, some 20 times since 1985. Uh, reaching about 20,000, 23,000. Well, you know, there are 130,000 applicants, and many of them are dying. I think about every year, because they're so old, you know, over 80, 90 years old, every year about 2,300 applicants are dying. Every year. So there's not going to, in a few years, there's not going to be any remaining 
uh, for family, family reunion anyways. So it's another human rights violation because, I mean, what kind of country prevents families from reun reuniting, even for just a moment? They use it as a political tool. Abduction of foreign nationals, Japanese, of course. Uh, we have a minister from, from Japan, but this is a huge issue in Japan. But they've also uh, abducted uh, citizens from Thailand, uh, Jordan, uh, China, uh, and certainly from South Korea. We have over, I mean, if you're counting the Korean War abductees, we're talking about, about 100,000 during the Korean War. You think about that number, 100,000. In the post-war period, uh, we're talking about over 500. POWs, about 500. Other violations, persecution of Christians. If you're labeled as a Christian, your survival rate is 22% in, according to one study. Okay. So it's just, you know, it's just, um, just to give you an idea of some of the um, known violations of human rights, human atrocities. So the international community has responded. Um, the US, Japan, EU have been very active. The UN has been very active. It's uh, in 2003, the UNHRC adopts its North Korean Human Rights Resolution. It, it um, appoints the first special rapporteur in 2004. The General Assembly also uh, starts adopting resolution every year. And uh, in 2013, uh, most importantly, the Commission of Inquiry is set up. And, and after one year of investigation, the COI comes up with a uh, path-breaking uh, report uh, on North Korean human rights violations and makes recommendations. And of course, in 2015, as part of the recommendation, the UN field structure for North Korean human rights established in Seoul, and of course, Sina Poulsen, who is uh, here, uh, is, heading, is heading this uh, very, very important work. South Korea, in comparison, um, passed the Human Rights Act in March 2016 after 11 years of infighting uh, within the National Assembly. So it got passed, so that was a good thing, but it really hasn't been followed up uh, uh, at, at all. Uh, like, for example, my position as the ambassador for North Korean, North Korean human rights was uh, created by this act, and yet uh, they haven't picked a successor to me. I mean, that's just one of the several um, issues with the, you know, not following the Human Rights Act, North Korean Human Rights Act in South Korea. So if there's one thing that you guys pick up and take home, you know, I, I hope it's about COI and the COI report. Um, and I hope you get, you, you get a chance to read some of it. Um, this COI report, which was headed by, um, as I mentioned earlier, Michael Kirby, was the most comprehensive and systematic investigation of the uh, situation and in North Korea. And I think it really meant a sea change in international awareness of the problem in North Korea. And what is the most important key point is that the COI report found that crimes against humanity is being perpetrated in North Korea. It made many recommendations North Korea to reform, but probably it won't take place because if it does do all the reforms, then you know we're not going to have the Kim Jong Un regime, you know, as we as we know. Um, it made quite a few recommendations to the UN and the international community. One of the most important of, of which was to tell the UN Security Council to refer the matter to the ICC, International Criminal Court. That's very important. And telling China, okay, telling China very boldly to um, stop sending North Korean defector back to North Korea. Because that goes against the principles of non refoulement Because if you're doing, if you do that, you are aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. With the recommendation, the UN General Assembly in 2014 uh, adopted a resolution that reflected a lot of these points that were recommended in the COI. <clears throat> and North Korea, you know, like no other time, when, when this was happening, it, 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 North Korea backpedaled. Okay? It, it, looked, it, it almost seemed like 
we found North Korea's Achilles gun, all right? Because North Korean Foreign Minister Lee Su Young attended the UNGA for the first time in 15 years. North Korea started sending uh, its diplomats to Europe and Southeast Asia to solicit their help. Okay? North Korea released the three Americans without really any sort of negotiations, just releasing on, on goodwill, inviting even the special rapporteur Darusman to North Korea, if only he would help to take out a few of the you know, COI recommendation aspects, such as the ICC referral of the North Korean leadership. And the international community as a whole also really was inspired by this, by this COI findings and the recommendations and probably 2014, 2015, 2016, those, those were sort of like the golden days of international campaign against human rights. The momentum was really building um, during those years. Now this um, conference addresses the age of summit diplomacy. So um, just a couple of words on this. I mean, the Trump factor is huge, I, I would think. Um, but unfortunately, we're getting kind of mixed signals, uh, particularly from um, President Trump. In 2017, it started out with war of words. But in 2018, particularly since the uh, the Olympics, Pyeongchang Olympics, and thereafter, you know, it's, it's, he's, he's, turned, he's turned his sort of um, attitude towards Kim Jong-un. I mean, the quotes are very self-explanatory. He's talking about the possibility of a major, major war with North Korea in 2017. And then in September 2018, he's talking about receiving beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un, and then we fell in love. Okay, so um, what to make of it, um, hard to say, but it's certainly not helping uh, the situation. I mean, Mr. Ji uh, Sung-ho was actually invited to the state of the, President Trump's State of the Union speech, right? So he was very, very vocal and seemed committed to North Korean human rights, and yet his turn he seems to have turned away from that uh, in recent, um, recent, most recently. So um, I'm going to actually um, skip this. I'm, it's just saying that you know diplomacy is great, um, but you know we've been here before, particularly over the six-party talks. But you know I painted it in yellow and red. It's only when North Korea needs and wants something, they, they act like they're relenting and giving up its nuclear weapons program, and then they get something, and then they're back to uh, the former self. So, you know, it's just an outline of, very brief outline of, you know, of North Korea's sort of ploy or tactics of negotiating, and then falling back, negotiating, falling back. But all the while, it's escalating in terms of its nuclear weapons program. There are ways to, um, to deal with the North Korean situation. The ICC referral is, uh, is mentioned. The General Assembly, although this is a long shot, I mean, there are ways. So, I mean, theoretically, I'm just mentioning the UN General Assembly Res Resolution 377. If the Security Council doesn't work, then the General Assembly can take on the responsibility to maintain peace and security. Universal jurisdiction is another. Um, we have, of course, the, um, the UN office here in Korea, which, you know, which is um, continuing uh, its work. Um, but the global community, I mean, if you look at, if you look at what the global community did uh, against the apartheid system in South Africa, to reverse the apartheid and eventually lead to the election of Nelson Mandela as president in 1994. Um, I mean, one thing is that the General Assembly, UN General Assembly, dis disapproved in 1974 South, South Africa's credentials and thus suspended its UN work. So its membership was not, uh, it was not kicked out, but it, was, it had no role in the UN until apartheid was reversed. Also, 
South Africa was prevented from participating in all sorts of sports and cultural uh, activities, boycott. Now look at what is happening with North Korea. It's just the reversal, isn't it? Okay. Sporting event, you cannot get North Korea more involved. Cultural events, okay? Um, in South Africa, this tactic, what the world international community did, did worked. With North Korea, is it working? Well, this is a question that you have to ask yourself and answer. Finally, what can you do as students? And these are just uh, some suggestions that I thought I would, I would uh, put down, you know, small events um, back home as film festivals, picture galleries, fundraising events, mm, arranging defectors to speak at your home universities, um, research on North Korean human rights, encouraging your government, if, if there are Chinese students here, you should write to your uh, President Xi Jinping that I heard that you were sending back North Korean defectors to North Korea. Uh, I don't think this is right. We should change. Helping, you know, like uh, link uh, stranded defectors in China, join student-run organizations, music, talk concerts to raise awareness, writing letters to celebrities, global leaders, talking to media. These are all, I mean, you're probably thinking, oh, what can I do? But if, you know, if like 10% of you guys here did something, it all adds up. And I think it will all contribute uh, to this effort that we're making. And I, I know I went a little bit over time, but uh, I'm really so happy to see you all uh, in this very, very important um, uh, conference. I hope you take something out of it, and I hope many of you continue your interest uh, and awareness and contribute to, uh, to improve the lives of the North Korean people who are still suffering under the dictatorial totalitarian system that is the Kim Jong-un regime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Lee John Hoon. That was a terrific keynote address. Um, I would now like to invite our panelists to join us on stage. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of former Deputy Unification Minister, uh, Mr. Kim so Woo here tonight. You may have noticed that beautiful flower arrangements. I'm not making a political statement here, but it's uh, the only South Korean political party that did send us a flower arrangement. That's the, uh, our Republican Party and uh, National Assemblyman uh, Cho Eun Jin. Uh, it's surely always a nice development when South Korean politicians and assemblymen do care about these events. My dear friend uh, Han Jin Lu is there with his colleague. Thank you for joining us. Um, we, uh, we are joined today by a uh, most distinguished uh, panel of speakers. And uh, what I'm going to do, since we are a little bit pressed for time, is going to be an introduction of uh, all of the uh, upcoming speakers. Uh, well, first and uh, foremost, I am delighted to uh, introduce uh, Sinan Polson, who uh, is the representative of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights here in Seoul. She has led the office established pursuant to the recommendation of the UNCOI since August 2015, has been previously in Liberia, Timor-Leste, Kyrgyzstan, Papua New Guinea, with Amnesty International previously, a Danish national, Sina, hails from um, the London School of Economics. Kim Kwang-jin uh, is, uh, all right, again, this is not a political message. All of our three escapee colleagues and friends who are part of a group of eight that met with President Trump last year. Uh, Mr. Chi Song Ho was also featured, as Ambassador Lee mentioned, at the State of the Union address. So anyway, this is probably one of their favorite pictures. This is the picture I picked. Uh, Mr. Kim Kwang Jin escaped together with his family in uh, 2003. He was a very senior North Korean official in charge of uh, currency, hard currency earning operations. 
Uh, he uh, is a graduate of most prestigious universities in North Korea, currently working for, on his PhD here, working for the Institute of National Security Strategy, widely published author, including three um, very significant reports he authored for us, for the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Mr. Chong Kwang-il is currently a very active advocate for North Korean human rights. He sends information to North Korea via different vehicles and means. He has continued to be an ardent advocate for North Korean human rights at the United Nations, before the U.S. Congress and elsewhere. He's a former political prisoner. He spent time at political prison number 15, political prison camp number 15, Yodok, in North Korea prior to finding his way here to South Korea. And of course, there's uh, Mr. Chi Song Ho, who uh, gave us that uh, very famous crotch moment, a truly iconic moment in the history of the North Korean human rights movement. I'm sure you all know the story. He, um, he uh, was disabled, he fell off a train and was disabled, uh, lost an arm and a, um, a leg while uh, foraging for food. He actually escaped and went for a very, very long distance just on crutches, found his way to freedom in South Korea, uh, continues to be a very active advocate for North Korean human rights for the freedom of the North Korean people. That said, I am going to turn the floor over to Ms. Sina Tolson, who is going to address the efforts of the UN office here, efforts directed toward accountability. Sina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg, and, and thank you, everyone, for being here, and, and Greg, in particular, for organizing this event. And thank you also to Ambassador Yi for setting up uh, your speech so that I can continue where you left off, um, which is, is very convenient. I wanted to start with the Commission of Inquiry that the UN uh, published the findings of in, in 2014. And really, to say that when this happened, the UN didn't come up with anything new. This was all based on work that had been done by civil society organizations, many of which are in this room today, for decades, uh, collecting information, sort of painstakingly talking and identifying to, with persons who'd escaped from North Korea and putting it all together and lobbying the United Nations. And I, I think when we look at the North Korea story of human rights. It's really a powerful example of how individuals who escaped together with civil society actors can make a difference in a, a big and bureaucratic system that is the United Nations. Um, it's, it's not often it's so visible, but in this case, it's, it's really a, a very clear link and, and a, a credit to, to all of those who came from North Korea, who were brave enough to speak out, and also to civil society. But, but just to recap what the findings of this uh, Commission of Inquiry were, uh, because I think it's important to remind ourselves where we were at in 2014. The Commission found that on the balance of probability, these crimes against humanity entailed the crimes of extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortions and other sexual violence, persecution on political, religious, racial, and gender grounds, the forcible transfer of population, the enforced disappearance of persons, and the inhumane act of knowingly causing prolonged starvation. So it's a fairly significant list. And they moreover also found that these crimes were committed pursuant to policies developed at the highest levels of the state, and were continuing quote, because the policies, institutions, and patterns of impunity that lie at their heart remain in place. This was in 2014, and I would say it is equally true in 2019. So the United Nations field-based structure was uh, established as a direct consequence and on recommendation of this commission of inquiry. And since uh, our establishment, 
the main overall purpose, although, although it's broken down more in the resolutions, is to really follow up and deepen the findings of the Commission of Inquiry. So I wanted to first uh, review a little bit how, we're, how we've been doing that for the past four years, but then also to move to what, what this age of engagement means for our office um, and for the accountability work in, in more broader terms. So first, the human rights situation is now firmly on the agenda of the main bodies of the United Nations, and I think this is a big legacy of the Commission of Inquiry Report. So although we may not have the uh, energy or, or the, the strife that we saw in, in 2014 when the report came first out, what we do have is a consistent and, and grinding presence of North Korean human rights in many of the main UN bodies. This includes the General Assembly, where every year now the, Gen the Secretary General has to present a report on human rights in North Korea to the member states. It comes out every October and there will be one coming out this year. It includes the Human Rights Council, where also every year you have a report on the situation of human rights in North Korea. And in fact, in both of these bodies you have two reports, because the Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in North Korea also writes reports. So there is this steady body of, of information that keeps generating every year. And it's followed by resolutions passed by member states where they request specific things to be happening. We've also, for four years in a row, had a hearing in the Security Council. Uh, sadly and unfortunately, last year we did not have a sufficient uh, member state support to have a, a, resol um, not a resolution, a debate on human rights in the Security Council. And uh, we very much would like to see that uh, re-emerge again this year, um, although it, it's quite difficult. Um, secondly, following the COI, we had something called a, a group of independent experts who looked at more concretely how specifically crimes, international crimes against uh, human rights could be followed up on and which mechanisms might be useful. And based on their recommendations, and this was in 2016, our office was granted particular um, resources to look into criminal justice accountability. And this means that we recruited staff uh, with uh, experience from other international criminal processes, Cambodia and, and elsewhere. And they are right as we speak, working away on analysis, on interviews, on identifying suitable testimonies, and on following up with civil society organizations on this kind of information. Um, so that is also ongoing, and this is long and hard and tedious work. It's, it's not going to lead to anything you know, that will be seen immediately, but it's something that needs to be done to preserve information in the longer run. Um, and that leads to the third point. We are strengthening and have been strengthening uh, interactions between the United Nations, both our office but also more broadly, and these civil society organizations, including persons from North Korea, but also other civil society organizations working in South Korea and also in the international community. And so what we hope to do is to really facilitate, I mean, one, uh, monitoring by civil society organizations that can contribute to uh, future uh, criminal or other, we can, whatever processes for human rights in North Korea, but also to allow civil society organizations to really have a voice within the UN, be it the Human Rights Council, be it side events, be it um, you know, other forums where we can raise human rights, including in, in treaty bodies and in the Universal Periodic Review, a uh, review of every country's human rights um, record that happens every four years, which we saw recently North Korea go through, and where I will say the, the input from international human rights organizations and those based in South Korea was, was absolutely critical, especially as we didn't have a single report, obviously, from inside North Korea. Um, again, the only place probably in the world where we don't have a, a civil society report coming from the country that's under review. Um, and finally, I want to point to our monitoring efforts, which can continue to uh, encompass interviews with persons who recently arrived from North Korea. Um, 
we continue to document patterns, we continue to see what's changing and what's not changing, and to make sure that this testimony really becomes part of a body of preserved evidence that whatever and whenever uh, a change happens, we can tap into so that we ensure accountability for those very serious crimes that are going on. Um, like I said, this is a sort of long-term, long-road, uh, uh, steadfast commitment uh, work that we undertake. And we do that regardless of whether you know, the tides are for engagement or for accountability. Because whatever the future holds for North Korea, we will need some kind of process that acknowledges wrongs, that uh, recognizes victims, that tries to tell the true story of what happened. And so preserving that evidence now is, is absolutely critical. And we know that from other places around the world as well. But what we see at present, and what I, the question I often come across is, is this issue of, uh, in the current context of engagement, uh, doesn't including human rights into the talks in North Korea undermine this prospects for denuclearization and peace and economic development and then by implication also human rights uh, progress because presumably economic development and denuclearization and peace would, would help the population so would also improve human rights. And my answer to that is, is actually no and if you ask that question there's sort of a, a lack of, of understanding of, of what this whole talks program and engagement is, is meant to result in in the, longer, in the longer run or even in the medium run. If one of the desired outcomes is improved security, and if we also seek improved security not only abroad but also for the people in North Korea, human rights is an absolute integral part of the process. And I want to raise four particular points, sorry Greg, I'm going too long, <laughs> um, in, this, in this regard. Um, the UN, and as Ambassador Lee already pointed out, recognized in its charter that development and human rights and peace and security are mutually reinforcing. They're the three pillars and you cannot have progress in one pillar and not in the others. The, the three are mutually reinforcing. To be lasting and to be meaningful, peace has to be underpinned by some level of, of justice internationally and domestically and locally. If these grievances are not addressed, and we've seen this in, in some of the places that were mentioned in the earlier speech, conflict is likely to reemerge. On the other hand, countries can much more effectively pursue development, um, economic progress, when they're able to provide physical security for those who are working and basic rights like the right to information, education, rule of law, food and shelter, and fair labor practices, I should add to that too. Secondly, for North Korea to emerge as a stable state, it's critical to build institutions aimed at serving the population rather than the leadership. These are the very institutions which are at the center of, uh, which are presently at the center of, of creating and implementing policies that violate human rights and harm the population. And so from the national to the local level, including neighborhood watch groups, um, addressing their role and building institutions that serve the population is a critical element of bringing human rights, but also peace and stability to the country. Third, the vulnerable groups of North Korea are the ones that have long borne the brunt of the suffering. These include people in rural areas, people of poor Sangbun, um, people, uh, of course, living in political prison camps or in prison camps in general, and, and many others. Um, these are the people who are operating in rudimentary markets, who face corruption by small-scale uh, actors who have better connections than them. And again, if North Korea is going to move towards a human rights or a secure situation, fulfilling, um, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is something we talk about a lot in the international community these days, 
it's critical that we also get these populations on board. And it's inconceivable that we can do that without some level of justice, without a fair system and rule of law, um, and attention to those who are most vulnerable. And finally, and, and again back to, to one of the points raised earlier, the kind of violations we are talking about in North Korea are not uh, of the character of a, a local police officer having a bad day or um, not being trained in adequate use of force or appropriate use of force. These are systematic and widespread and very serious violations um, that are happening at, at, at really the top levels of government. And so they need to be addressed in that way and, and through an, uh, a process. And not addressing them also undermines uh, other goals we have like non-repetition guarantees or restoration of the rights of the victims. It is of course true that including human rights in talks with North Korea is no easy feat. Um, and it has been said that this is not the right time or that, that it's simply too difficult to raise human rights. But what I would say is that's the nature of negotiations. If, if, it was, if, they, if these issues were not difficult to raise, we, we wouldn't need this elaborate process. Talking about nuclear weapons and, and disarmament is, is also very difficult, but no one says, oh, let's, let's forget about the nuclear weapons for, for the time being and address the crimes against humanity first, because without addressing those, there's no chance that we can verify whether we've had denuclearization. So we need to do the two things hand in hand. We need to, to integrate human rights. We need to also be very serious, of course, about denuclearization and, and security. Um, but keep in mind that they are mutually reinforcing. Um, and so I think from the Human Rights Office in Seoul, this is all I will say at this stage. <laughs> um, and we can answer questions later. Thank you very much. Hong Jun, we'll go to you next. Thank you, Greg, uh, for arranging the, uh, again this wonderful uh, event. And thank you all for coming here. Uh, my job tonight is to introduce you uh, the political climate in North Korea now, what's going on there, and also uh, economic situation. Uh, in, in the last April, they changed their constitution, so they are having a new constitution in a new era of third Kim rule. And they made, made that constitution as Kim Jong-un's uh, constitution. They officially don't call it his, but uh, in the past, you know, uh, they call it Kim Il-sung's constitution, the first uh, leader of North Korea. Uh, but anyhow, the contents, the change made in the new one uh, represents that, you know, it is now uh, the constitution itself uh, be became, became you know, Kim Jong-un's and the real euro and days began for Kim Jong-un and the third leader of North Korea now. Uh, so they made uh, the two kings' ideas and their theory as history uh, and say goodbye to uh, military force policy of course. Uh, and also they deleted uh, Kim Il-sung's uh, idea and methodology. They call it, you know, uh, they define Kim Il-sung's uh, uh, idea into three, Zhuqi ideology and revolutionary theory and methodology into three parts. But they just you know, changed all the old, deleted the old ways and uh, idea, ideas uh, and uh, put, uh, replaced them with Kim Jong-un's new uh, ideology and way of thinking and policies. So they had a uh, 
대한 어, 대한의 사업 체계 that is you know the method launched to run the businesses in the industry they deleted that and they have chungsalli j u n g s i n that is chungsalli spirit that is for agriculture but they also deleted that so uh, a lot of changes there and they named kim jong un as a as a real representative and head of north korea in the past they didn't do that but now this time they made it very clear that kim is at the top of the leadership And uh, they put this word "silly." Actually, in 2002, uh, when Kim Jong Il was alive, uh, they introduced a big change in their economic management system, which is called uh, July 1st you know, economic uh, management system. Uh, and from that on, uh, Kim Jong Il uh, uh, invented this word "silly." Silly means uh, interest or profit, something like that. And he couldn't say himself that you know we need to introduce capitalist way of you know uh, business and market economy. So he uh, expressed his own way to to have a change. You know, silly. And now they have that word in the constitution, which means you know they want to introduce some new, you know, way of managing their economy, and they also put an emphasis on the role of the cabinet. Of course, for decades, uh, two kings, previous kings, they of course you know emphasized that, but they put it in the in the new constitution. That means the economy, uh, the cabinet should take care of that and should play more role uh, in that direction. So having more role means having more power and having more access to the resources, money, especially the foreign cash. I don't know whether it, they will do that, they will practice that, but anyhow, they made that change in the new constitution. Yeah, that is the rough idea. Uh, what they made a change to the constitution, uh, and c h e o n g s position. He is now uh, he replaced Kim Yong Nam's position, but actually downgraded. So when they called him, they first uh, called him as the first vice. Chairman of the State Affairs Commission. In the past, Kim Yong Nam was uh, the uh, was the chairman of the Supreme People's Assembly, and he represent, represented North Korea externally. But you know, they have this kind of change. And the military, the power, uh, uh, the armies, and the military influence in their policy. They just. They're trying to reduce that, you know, shrink their influence. So now the chief of political bureau, uh, Kim s u g i l he is no longer a member of the political presidium. In the past, you know, uh, every single uh, chief of the the army's political bureau uh, was the member, and he was named even before the uh, prime minister. But now. You know, They don't have him in that uh, position, and we are now seeing uh, the increase of Kim Yo Jong's role, Kim Jong's sister. Uh, very quick promotion, of course, and uh, more, uh, you know, a lot of work uh, to help his uh, brother, co brother. Mm. And now North Korea ha has, you know, three. Very important national projects, but these are all related to results and you know uh, building of some you know uh, good area. So very strange to see that you know we are now talking about 
nuclear plant, nuclear power plant, you know, nuclear energy and 5G industry and technology and you know electronics and etc. But still, North Korea they cannot have that kind of you know economic project. So, three major uh, uh, national. Uh, projects are now all related to these results, you know, Samjion and, you know, Wonsan, Sweep, uh, Wonsan, what, sea, sea result, and Yangdo, this, you know, uh, hot, hot, how do you call it? Well, hot, well, you know, Onchon, hot springs, yes. So, yeah, that's what's going on there. And economic situation. The most important uh, gauge that we can check uh, of North Korea's economic situation, there are, there are two. One is exchange rate and the other is a uh, rice price. Now the, the exchange rate is very stable for several years. Rice price, it rose, but they began to have a change in that. You know. So uh, the rice itself uh, from 4,502, now 5,200. It is not a big change, maybe 10 percentage. In the past, they had, during the past, in the previous years, they had that change, of course, but anyhow, the chart shows that it is going up. And for corn, corn uh, price, it is very, is uh, clearer, you know, the upward trend. So uh, it was the price of that one kilo was, you know, 1,275, you know, 1,300, somewhere there, and now it's 2,000. So big change, around you know, 50%. So I think they are now beginning to feel uh, the aftermath, the result of the economic sanction. Uh, and with their trade data, it is clearer, you know, it shrinked a lot. Actually, the export to China, 45 percentage, uh, was by an you know, excavation industry, this coal uh, export. Uh, it is stopped now, so they're having very difficult times with their hard currency earning and and their trade and also their economic situation. And I was asked to talk about, you know, this uh, North Korea's royal court economy and their third economy. Uh, you know, uh, when Zhang was alive, he tried to, he actually created this, you know, uh, a third economy. They, they had, they don't call it the first economy, but the people's economy, the national economy, controlled by the cabinet, it is regarded as a first economy. And the second economy, they call it, they named as a second economy. It is related to this munitions industry. The guys who are, having, who are doing this uh, nuclear test and missile test, they belong to this umbrella. And after uh, Kim Jong Il died, uh, Zhang Zhengte created this third economy with Office Number Three Eight and uh, Department uh, Fifty Four. That is uh, actually belonged to the military, but he took it and used that department as for selling coal to China. And Lunga Eight Eight Eight. Uh, this is an organization uh, work for working for uh, Kim Il Sung's uh, Kim family. Uh, his you know party and gifts for the foreign guests, presidents, whatever you know they provide all these needs and very good you know company. And with this and also external. Construction Bureau. With these you know, organizations, he created this uh, economy, a third economy. And there were friction with this one uh, against, you know, Office Number 3 9 under uh, North Korea's you know, Workers' Party. 
So the chief of this, you know, office number 39, wrote a beautiful report and gave it, gave it to Kim Jong-un, introducing the history of that and how his predecessor, Kim Jong-il, took care of that and how they benefited from that. And he read it and just, you know, decided to get rid of this, you know, economy three. Uh, uh, third economy. So that was one of the core causes that made Kim Jong-un uh, decide to kill you know, his uncle. So this is uh, what happened you know, to this royal court economy and uh, third economy. So now uh, after Zhang was killed, this was dissolved and most of them were belong to Mojib into office number 39. So 39 is still there. It is controlling the most part of uh, best foreign cash uh, uh, businesses in North Korea for Kim's uh, purse and funds. Uh, and the businesses under the military, under the security apparatus, under the uh, people's, you know, Imin Bon Song people's, you know, security uh, organization, ministry, they're still there. You know, there are some changes, but still there. You know, he, Kim gives them these economic interests and benefits for them to live on that. So this is the uh, rough introduction uh, of what I've changed what have changed in North Korea in our food economy and also that their royal court economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kwang Jin. I'm going to give the floor to uh, Mr. Chong Kwang Il, president of the North Chain for North Korea. <laughs> Good afternoon. 제가 오늘 발표할 내용은 예, 남북 회담 발언은 탈북자의 관점인데요. My topic today is uh, yeah, the summit diplomacy from the viewpoint of North Korean escapees. 이 참혹한 현실에 대해서 제가 어떻게 말해야 되는지 잘 모르겠더라고요. I don't know how to explain uh, the, the terrifying facts of the current situation in North Korea. 그러나 현실을 직시해야 되기 때문에 이 이야기는 해야 될것 같습니다. Uh, but because you have to tell the truth, I'm just about to say what I'm just about to say. I met President Trump in February 2018. I had high hopes, but then after Singapore, after Hanoi, and after inter-Korean summit diplomacy, I realized that politicians were just sacrificing and using human rights, forgetting about human rights for their own political interest. Um, of course, uh, denuclearization uh, is aimed to uh, save lives on the Korean Peninsula, all lives. But as I see the current situation, denuclearization doesn't seem to be meant to save lives. It seems to be meant to, uh, to cement, to strengthen uh, political power and political positions. Uh, on the 10th of December 2018, on the 70th anniversary of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, at the ceremony held on that occasion, President Moon Jae-in of South Korea said that all people uh, as a birthright are entitled to uh, freedom, dignity, and equality. However, President Moon, 
did not make one single reference to the uh, abysmal situation of human rights in North Korea and basically equated peace on the Korean Peninsula with human rights. Uh, President Moon Jae-in is a human rights lawyer by formation. However, he doesn't seem to have any interest in North Korean human rights. Uh, after the inauguration of the Moon Jae-in government, uh, North Korean human rights policy or action aimed uh, to address the North Korean human rights situation has declined dramatically. The South Korean president has a moral responsibility not only toward the people of South Korea, but toward all Koreans living on the Korean Peninsula and all people living on the Korean Peninsula. 북한 인권에 대한 침묵하는 북한 인권을 침묵하는 것은 세계 인권 선언과 북한 주민들을 배신하는 행위입니다. Uh, staying quiet on this topic of uh, North Korean human rights amounts to a betrayal of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a betrayal of the people of North Korea. 또한 현 정부는 북한 인권 관련 지원을 다 끊어버리고 결국 단체들이 활동을 못하게 하고 있습니다. Government has suspended all support and funding for uh, groups run by North Korean activists and has pretty much ceased and desisted the activity of these organizations. Pursuant to the Republic of Korea North Korean Human Rights Act ratified in September 2016, pursuant to Article 10.1 uh, of this Act, the, the government uh, was supposed to establish a North Korean Human Rights Foundation whose mission would be to investigate the North Korean human rights situation, to promote inter-Korean dialogue on human rights, to promote humanitarian assistance, to address the North Korean human rights situation, and to promote the development of research and policy aimed, on, aimed at improving the North Korean human rights situation. 하지만 한국 국회 여야가 기싸움으로 하다, 하다 보니 이번 구성도 제대로 안 되고 그렇게 늦어지자 정부는 북한 인권 재단 사무실 자체를 폐쇄시켰습니다. However, because of tension and conflict between the ruling party and the opposition party of South Korea, the board of the North Korean Human Rights Foundation was not staffed, and eventually the government decided to shut down the office of the North Korean Human Rights Foundation here. Uh, the result was that funding dedicated to North Korean human rights activities declined by 92%. 지금 현재 한국의 문재인 대통령은 평화를 원한다고 하지만 이는 평화의 평화를 가는 길을 정진이 아니라 후퇴하고 있습니다. So uh, the president of the Republic of Korea, President Moon Jae-in, is talking about advancing along the road of peace. I do not see this as an advance. I, as advancement, I see this as a retreat. 한국의 국회와 정치권에는 종북 세력이 너무 많습니다. Uh, there are too many sympathizers of North Korea in the South Korean National Assembly and amongst the political class of South Korea, amongst politicians here. 예전에 주제 사상을 신봉하던 사람들이 정부에 들어가서 정책을 하다 보니까 큰 문제가 많이 일어나는 겁니다. Um, there are former students and fans of North Korea's 
Juche self-reliance ideology um, who are now in government and are in a position where they're moving policy. 또한 한국 언론 미디어가 북한 정보를 제대로 전달하지 않고 있다고 봅니다. Uh, moreover, South Korean media do not report properly on North Korea, do not convey such information properly. 현재도 김정은 독재 정권하에서 북한 주민들이 신음하고 있습니다. Um, the, the people of North Korea continue to suffer under the weight of the oppression of the Kim Jong-un regime in the north. 저희는 나름대로 에... 유엔의 북한, 북한에 실종된 전시범 수용소 수감자 명단을 전달하는 등 여러 가지 행사 확인을 에, 하는 활동을 지속적으로 하고 있습니다. Uh, fortunately, we have been able to bring to the attention of UN agencies lists of names of North Korean prisoners, North Korean political prisoners. We have been able to uh, verify their whereabouts and bring that to the attention of the United Nations. 우리 탈북자들이 생명의 위협을 받으면서 북한에 정보를 보내는 일을 하고 있습니다. Although our lives have been threatened, we continue to send information into North Korea. 저희는 매월 예, 강화도에서 조류를 이용해 가지고 이해식 북한의 정보 유입을 보내는 활동을 가, 하며 또 북한 주민들의 희망을 주는 활동을 합니다. Uh, we North Korean escapees give hope to the people who remain in North Korea by uh, using the, the underwater current, the current uh, in the West Sea, uh, and uh, launching um, information, basically launching rice bottles that are taken by the current up north. We, uh, we do this twice a month to try to do our best and inform the people in the north. 예, 우리가 왜 자신이 사비까지 들어가면서 이런 일을 할까요? Why would we use and spend our own funds, our own money to do this, to send information to the north? 우리 탈북자들은 북에 있을 때 USB SD 카드를 통해 가지고 외부 소식을 접했습니다. 그러고 그러다 보니까 예, 북한이 아닌 그 외부가 어떻게 살고 있는 걸 알게 되었습니다. The explanation is simple. What changed our hearts and minds while we were living in North Korea was accessing information saved on those USBs and SD cards surreptitiously smuggled into the North. Uh, if one talks to recent arrivals, recently arrived defectors here in the South, you come to the realization of how effective these information operations are. Of course, we have used USBs, we're using USBs to send information to North Korea, but we're in the process of preparing to use other vehicles as well to deliver information to the country. Uh, I support humanitarian assistance. I'm fully in favor of humanitarian assistance. 그러나 단 조건이 있습니다. 검증이 가능해야 지원을 하지 검증을 가능하다면 지원할 필요가 없다고 봅니다. However, there is one caveat. We need verification. We need thorough verification in order to send humanitarian assistance into North Korea. Without verification, there should be no humanitarian assistance. 1990년도에 북한에 엄청난 식량과 여러 가지 그 많은 지원을 했는데 그게 미사일로 돌아서 우리한테 왔습니다. So in the 1990s, there was a grave humanitarian crisis in North Korea. Humanitarian assistance, food assistance, was sent into the country. But the regime turned this humanitarian assistance into missiles and nuclear weapons. 인도적 지원도 중요하지만 중요한 것은 북한의 최신 정보를 유지시켜 가지고 구두를 민주화 세력으로 키우는 것이 가장 중요하다고 봅니다. It is very important to enlighten the people of North Korea. It is very important to make them aware of the 
value and the importance of democracy, the democratic values, and the democratic political system. 우리는 이들에게 북한에 있는 북한의 반체제 세력이 있습니다. 이들에게 우리는 희망을 심어줘야 합니다. There are forces that oppose the regime in North Korea. We must give them hope. 예, 사실 저 같은 경우에도 북한으로부터 생명 위협을 받고 있습니다. 지구 끝까지 가서 저를 죽여버리겠다고 협박도 했고요. 그러나 우리는 계속 할 것입니다. 우리가 그렇게 함으로 인해 가지고 그만큼 북한의 위협이라는 걸 생각할 때 정보가 얼, 네. 북한의 최신 정보가 들어가는 것이 얼마큼 효과적인가를 알수 있을 것입니다. Uh, I have received threats. Many of us have received threats to our lives. My life has been threatened. I have been threatened with punishment on behalf of the people. I see this as a very positive evaluation of the efficiency of the work that I do for the people of North Korea, and I am never going to stop. I am going to continue my efforts. 이번에 박상아 씨 동생이 중국에 가서 체포되었습니다. 중국 공안에. 한승을 하는 과정에 체포되는데 예전에 박상아 씨 동생하고 저하고 드론을 가지고 에, 중국에서 북한으로 마이크로 SD 카드를 살포한 적이 있었습니다. 그 사건으로 연이돼 가지고 박상아 씨 동생이 중국에서 체포되어서 한국에 수방되는 일까지 있었습니다. Uh, there is a famous activist, Park Sang Hak, very well known, a former North Korean who launches balloons uh, into North Korea, leaflet balloons. Um, his brother was working with us on some of these activities of sending information via China into North Korea through micro SD cards. Uh, he was arrested there recently in China and uh, he was basically expelled from China in the process. 저는 앞으로도 북한의 민주화와 정치 위법 수용소 해체를 위해서 더 많은 노력을 할 것입니다. I will continue to do my best and strive to bring democracy to the people of North Korea and to uh, dismantle, to get rid of North Korea's political prison camps. 감사합니다. Thank you. Uh, good evening, I'm Chi Song Ho and I'm an activist for North Korean Human Rights. Uh, uh, today I'm going to address uh, our feelings, uh, the views of North Korean escapees on the three U.S. North Korea summits that have already taken place. 네, 먼저 이제 북한 주민들이 어, 미국을 이제 바라보는 관점에 대해서 좀 보려고 합니다. First, let me tell you a little bit about what North Koreans think about the United States. 어, 이제 북한 당국은 미국의 거리 박살 책동 또 이제 그 제재로 인해 가지고 우리가 이렇게 살 수밖에 없다고. 90년, 1990년대부터 지금까지 계속 이야기하고 있습니다. North Korean official propaganda has blamed the dire humanitarian situation of North Korea since the 1990s on the blockade imposed by the United States by the US imperialists blaming every problem, every evil faced by the people of North Korea on the United States. 그런데 이제 1990년대 이후 이제 북한 주민들의 생각이 좀 변하게 됩니다. However, after the 1990s, uh, the views of the North Korean people on the United States, the views of the United States, have begun to shift. Uh, so, while witnessing all the abuse, the abysmal abuse uh, we were experiencing, we were hoping that somebody in this world would take notice and would care about us. Uh, so, uh, eventually, I was in a position to do that. Uh, 
So uh, there is a reason why the people of North Korea got to change their views of the United States. 2004년 미국의 어, 2004년 7월 이제 미국 하원을 통과하고 이제 9월에 이제 상원을 통과한 어, 북한 인권법이 그 WBC 이제 행정부 이제 그 대통령을 통해 가지고 전 세계에 이제 발표됐다는 사실입니다. Uh, the U.S. North Korean Human Rights Act of 2004, which uh, passed both houses during the administration of President George W. Bush, uh, passed the House of Representatives in July and then the Senate in uh, September, and the entire world found out that the United States had, uh, had passed this legislation, uh, the North Korean Human Rights Act. 예, 그 사실을 이제 북한 주민들이 알게 되었고요. 저 역시도 이제 들었었습니다. So the people of North Korea also found out about the U.S. North Korean Human Rights Act. 예, 감사했고요. And I'm very grateful. 음, 최근 이제 북한 주민들이 좀더 이제 변화된 생각을 갖게 되었습니다. Uh, North Koreans have changed even more if you look at them today. 북한 이제 시장 활동에서 자유로움을 이제 추구하기 시작했고요. They began, began to experience freedom while engaging in market activities. 사상 저 이제 통제에서 자유롭기를 원하는 사람들이 늘고 있습니다. Uh, they used to be strictly bound by ideology, but they're beginning to slowly but surely escape those boundaries. 북한 이제 정치적 이제 조직 생활에서도 아, 이제 좀 탈피하려고 하는 이제 사람들이 이제 보이고 있고요. Uh, there are even people who are no longer participate uh, as or not as, as strict about their participation in group activities centered on political indoctrination in North Korea. 예, 사회적인 면에서도 이제 자유로움을 추구하는 사람들이 이제 늘고 있습니다. Uh, the number of people who uh, engage in social interaction a little bit more freely, then that number is on the increase. 최근 이제 대한민국에 입국한 탈북자들의 이야기를 이제 들어보면 북한 주민들은 이런 이야기를 한다고 합니다. 그 미국이나 이제 남한이 이제 우리, 우리를 어, 통치해줬으면 좋겠다. 그러면 조금이나마 더 자유로울 수 있겠다고 이제 이야기한다고 합니다. So if talk to uh, recent arrivals in South, in South Korea, they will even tell you many of us wish that South Korea or the United States took over. If they did, took over North Korea. If they did, we would have more freedom. 이런 이제 상황에서 이제 그 미국 이제 정상회담이 이루어졌는데요. Uh, under these circumstances, what happened was uh, the U.S. DPRK summit. Uh, uh, I think that this was a big burden to Kim Jong-un. 첫째로는 이제 민심이 이제 번외하는 그런 사인들이죠. So first of all, this is a regime that uh, had preached anti-Americanism. 또한 이제 둘째로는 어, 북한의 이제 그 체제를 유지하는 그 핵심 계층에 대한 이제 공급이 이제 부족해지는 것을 이제 느끼게 되었습니다. So uh, the regime critically depends on the core elites for its survival, but due to economic sanctions, access to luxury goods from the outside world to the good life, that access has been severed, has been severely restricted. 또한 이제 지난해 초 지난해 초에 있었던 연두교서의 탈북자의 초청과 백악관의 탈북자들의 그 초청을 보면서 김정은도 아마 느끼는 점이 있었을 겁니다. Of course, uh, Kim Jong Un must have taken notice that a North Korean escapee was invited to the State of the Union address last year. Kim Jong Un must have taken notice that a group of North Korean escapees met with the U.S. President a few days later. 이런 식으로는 이제. 김정은 생존이 어렵다고 판단됐을 것 같습니다. So uh, his uh, life and his survival became a little bit more difficult because of those circumstances. 또한 이 김정은은 정상회담을 통해서 목적하는 바도 있었죠. Of course, uh, he had his own objectives as he engaged in summit diplomacy. 
북한을 국제 사회의 핵 보유국으로 인정을 받는 일이었습니다. Of course, uh, what he wants is to receive recognition from the international society as a nuclear weapon state. 어, 미국이 위엔을 통한 대북 제재를 좀 무력화하려고 하는 그 생각도 있었고요. Of course, he wants to uh, to weaken, he wants to undermine the uh, international economic sanctions regime imposed by the United States and the United Nations. 미국 정상회담 협상을 통해서 북한이 이제 정상적인 국가의 그 이미지, 김정은이 정상적인 지도자의 이미지를 이제 찾고자 했습니다. And through summit diplomacy, Kim Jong Un's intention is to present North Korea as a normal state and to present himself as a normal leader. 어, 트럼프 대통령이 6월 12일 이제 싱가포르에서 이제 김정은과 정상회담을 했는데요. Uh, President Trump met again, uh, met, met in Singapore with, uh, with uh, Kim Jong Un in June. Uh, is it the June the 12th, of course, yes. Yeah. Uh, 이제, uh, 북한은 이제 2016년 이제 3월 26일부터 미국을 핵으로 이제 공격하겠다고 이야기하고 여러 차례의 핵실험과 미사일 발사를 이제 감행했었죠. Of course, uh, North Korea even threatened in 2016 to uh, conduct a nuclear attack against the United States and has uh, tested nuclear weapons on multiple occasions. Uh, Trump 대통령은 국가, 이제 미국의 국가 통수권자로서 이제 국민과 뭐 사회의 이제 안전을 이제 지, 지켜야 될 의무가 있었다고 생각되고 또한 이제 그 상황에서 전쟁이냐 아니면 협상의 방법이냐 이런 상황에서 이제 협상을 택한 것 같습니다. Of course, under those circumstances, President Trump had a big responsibility to protect the United States and the people of the United States. He had two alternatives, two choices, war or negotiation, and he chose negotiation. 어, 싱가포르 정상회담을 통해서 미국이 입장은 FF91이 늘 이제 이야기했었죠. So at the Singapore summit, the United States confirmed its uh, opening position in the negotiations, its ultimate objective of FFVD, full, final, verifiable denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, 정상회담이 있고 나서 이제 미국 상원 하원 하원 이제 상원에서는 대북 제재지 법안도 이제 만들어졌고 또 오토 원비어법도 이제 만들어졌습니다. Well, after the summit, both houses of Congress in the United States passed legislation on uh, North Korean economic sanctions. Moreover, the Otto Warmbier Act, the Otto Warmbier Sanctions Act was also passed. 어, 시간이 지나 어, 2019년 2월에 싱가포르에서 아, 하노이에서 정상회담이 다시 있었죠. In uh, following up on the June 2018 summit in Singapore in February 2019, a second summit meeting was held in Hanoi, Vietnam. 어, 북한은 이제 top-down 방식을 이제 선호하고 있습니다. Of course, North Korea's approach to summit diplomacy is a top-down approach. 어, 제가 알고 있기에는 어, 협상 과정에도 이제 북한 이제 그 당국자들은 어, 중요한 결정은 이제 김정은이 한다. 또한 그러니까 그결 결과적인 이제 결단은 이제 김정은이 한다고 이야기했고 또한 이제 거기서 좋은 일이 있을 것으로 이야기한 것으로 제가 알고 있습니다. So uh, their approach to the negotiation has been top down. It's uh, Kim Jong Un who is the ultimate negotiator, and they were truly hoping, as far as I know, for a good result for them out of this summit meeting in Hanoi. 전 세계 이목이 집중했는데 가장 크게 반응했던 북한 주민들이죠. Uh, so of course the whole world was watching, and especially the people of North Korea were watching. 북한 주민들은 정상회담만 하면 모든 것이 다 이루어진다고 이제 생각을 했었습니다. Uh, North Koreans thought that oh, if they're going to have a summit meeting, all problems are going to be resolved. 결과적으로는 결렬이 이제 되었던 것이죠. Uh, well, 
Eventually, nothing came out of it. 큰 이제 문제점이 이제 생겼습니다. So they got a problem on their hands. 어 무결점에 리더인 이제 김정은이 신이 아니라는 사실을 이제 알게 된 거죠. So uh, the summit meeting yielded no results. So obviously, Kim Jong Un is no longer a deity. Kim Jong Un is no longer a god. Kim Jong Un appeared fallible. 어 이제 주체 사상을 이제 고집했고 그 주체 사상이 있어서도 이제 수령의 이제 영도가 어, 있어야 한다고 했었는데 결과적으로는 수령 어, 수령의 영도의 문제점을 이제 보여준 것입니다. So the, the supreme leader is supposed to be perfect, pursuant to Juche self-reliance ideology. However, this exposed a deep fallacy in Juche ideology itself by exposing the leader's vulnerability and frailty. 어 김정은이 북한으로 이제 돌아가서 그 다음에 처음으로 이제 했던 이제 그뭐 이제 대외적으로 했던 그 메시지가 3월 9일에 있었습니다. So uh, Kim Jong Un went back, and the, the message that went to the outside world was issued on the 9th of March after the summit. 네, 그 공식적인 행사는 제2차 전국 조국 선전 일꾼 대회에서 한 이야기인데요. So uh, at the propaganda event held then, uh, my nationwide propaganda event held then. 만일 이제 위대성을 이제 부각시킨다고 하면서. 그 내용이 그 일부입니다. 만일 위대성을 부각시킨다고 하면서 수령이 혁명 활동과 풍모를 신비화하면 진실을 가려게 된다라는 그 이야기를 했습니다. So of course again it was a statement focusing on the leader's prowess and the leader's capability to harness all energies in order to move the country forward. 3대를 세습하면서 신격화를 이제 만들어 왔는데 그 메시지는 주는 바가 크다고 저는 생각합니다. Uh, so of course they felt the need to do that, and obviously that came out of this sense of vulnerability. Uh, the leader's uh, personality cult was developed across three generations, but now, perhaps for the first time, uh, the leader's vulnerabilities are exposed. Uh, 제가 이제 보기에는 북한이 핵을 포기하지 않을 것이라고 생각합니다. 그러나 협상은 이제 계속하려고 이제 할것 같습니다. In my view, North Korea will not give up its nuclear weapons, but will strive to continue to engage in diplomacy and negotiations. Uh, we cannot really hope for the denuclearization of North Korea. Let me just say something about North Korean human rights. 어 이제 북 미국 이제 정상회담이 이제 이어지고 있는 상황이고 또한 이제 북한 인권 문제가 언급됐냐 안 됐냐를 많이 이야기합니다. So there are ongoing talks, ongoing summit diplomacy between the United States and North Korea. The question is, will human rights be included in the talks, or will human rights not be included in the talks? 그만큼이나 중요한 중요하니까요. So that's a very important point. 제가 알고 있기로는 어, 어느 정도 북한 인권 문제에 대해서 언급이 있는 것으로 알고 있습니다. 아 이제 그 북미 정상회담에서 이제 미국 이제에서 이제 북한 인권에 대해서 어, 이야기한 것으로 알고 있습니다. So uh, based on what I know, uh, the United States did bring up some points about the human rights situation during this rounds of summit diplomacy. 이게 인권 문제는 생명의 이제 문제이고 이제 정말 존엄의 이제 문제입니다. So it's human rights is all about life. It's all about dignity, human dignity. 정상회담은 어떻게 이제 더 발전할지 이제 어, 아니면 어, 어떻게 될지 이제 알 수는 없죠. We cannot predict the future of summit diplomacy. 그러나 이제 북한 정권으로부터 피해를 당한 이제 탈북민들과 또한 그 땅에서 지금도 인권 유린을 이제 당하고 있는 북한 주민들 이제 그들이 인권에 대한 책임 규명은 또 다른 문제라고 생각하고 그 문제는 끝까지 저희가 해야 될 일이라고 저는 생각합니다. However, we do have a big responsibility. We do have a big responsibility to care for the people of North Korea. 
who are still under the yoke of the regime, whose rights are still being violated. Thank you very much. All right, so I have failed you as moderator. We're seriously over time right here. Uh, I'm going to take just two questions, if you don't mind, and we'll make it very quick. Please specify to whom you're addressing the question. Well, please, go ahead. Uh, and do we have a mic runner? First of all, my name is Jin Yim, and I'm I major in USCC department at Hangul University, Hangul University of Foreign Studies. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to thank thank for the lecture of yours. Um, I want to ask you ask a question to second person. Am I right? Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I heard uh, what you said. The North Korea under underestimates peace and economic development. Then I'm wondering the reason why the North Korea um, take part in takes part in the summit. I want to hear. I want to listen to your opinion. Um. Why, so your question is why North Korea takes part in the summit? Well, I think uh, there are many reasons, but I think one of the reasons is that, that actually North Korea economically is, is not doing fantastically under the sanctions and, and actually do need some, uh, or is, is attempting to, to get some, some relief on, on that front. So, so that's one reason. Um, I think that there are a range of other reasons that, that have very little to do with human rights, actually, so I, I apologize if I'm speaking out of line, but, but also political reasons that have to do with, with uh, showing uh, the, their leader speaking to the other big leader of the world uh, and, and sending a, a signal politically in, in that sense. Um, so, so I think there are uh, very compelling reasons for North Korea to, to engage in, in that sense. Um, and, and perhaps also a, an overconfidence, or maybe it's not an overconfidence, that, that they can handle the situation and that they can maneuver these negotiations in their favor, which, which indeed it, it seems that uh, so far uh, they're not doing so bad at. I mean, if, if we look at what North Korea said a few years ago when I arrived, they, they said they were going to uh, uh, achieve a nuclear status and, and finish their testing and then they would engage and actually that's kind of what they're saying still that they've done um, so now they are engaging from a point of uh, a strong point security wise um, and, and that that is uh, not a, a very nice position for us to be in but but actually, I, I think that, that probably, unfortunately, is, is what happened. And, and we, as the international community, have to be very principled and very smart of, of how we engage with that so that we don't just allow more time to pass while security development and, and weapons development continues. Well. If we have no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank our distinguished. Oh, uh, okay. We'll take one more. Ve a very quick one, please. Yeah, sure. um, I'll be loud. So, since early last year, ROK has introduced around 50 flights from China to um, Seoul, which includes the Liaoning province as well as Shenyang and all those provinces. I just want to know, because in one of the slides, it was said that. We need to help strengthen the factors in China so that they're not deported back into North Korea. Um, so I just want to know what is the RK, why do they have to do a circuitous route to Laos, Vietnam, Mongolia, all those places? Why can't the ROK government um, consider bringing them directly and safely just from Shenyang to Incheon? Thank you. Well, 
themselves. So once they find their way inside South Korean diplomatic missions or concert missions, they get protection, they're debriefed, they find a way out of China or other third countries. It's extraordinarily difficult to get there. There are multiple security perimeters around diplomatic missions that are suspected of aiding refugees escape. So that's why they have to get really creative and go through other third countries. It's uh, extraordinarily difficult to, to depart directly from China, actually. So many of them go through China, but then again, they receive protection at various diplomatic missions, including South Korea diplomatic missions in third countries. Things in China are really, really difficult these days. Well, thank you very much. Fantastic questions. I wish we could spend more time together. We'll do it again. Um, let me thank Ambassador Lee jong -hun, our keynote speaker, Sina Paulson, Kim Kwang Jin, Mr. Chong Kwang Il, and uh, Mr. Chi Song Ho. They've been terrific speakers. And thank you, all of you. Thank all of you who have helped organize this event. Hofs has been terrific. As always, please join me in thanking the speakers.